Hey everyone, this is the Multipolarista Podcast. I'm Ben Norton, and today I'm going to be talking about the latest political developments in Mexico. Now, the mainstream corporate media coverage of Mexico in English is atrocious. It's so bad. We really need to understand that Mexico is a very important country politically, economically. It is the 10th largest country on earth in terms of population. It actually has a larger population than Japan. It's the second largest country in Latin America after Brazil. And Mexico obviously shares a massive border with the U.S. And its politics is really dictated a lot, unfortunately, by the history of U.S. imperialism and U.S. meddling. And we've seen since 2018 an important historic shift in Mexican politics with the election of the left-wing president Andrés Manuel López Obrador known as AMLO, A-M-L-O, in, by the, the acronym. And he ushered in this progressive wave he has called the fourth transformation. And today I'm joined by a great Mexican professor and activist to discuss the latest accomplishment, victory of the fourth transformation, which is the historic nationalization of lithium in Mexico. Now, Mexico has very large oil reserves and going back to the Mexican Revolution of the 1910s up to 1920 and the new constitution that was written in that revolutionary period and the progressive governments following of Cárdenas and others, Mexico nationalized its oil and minerals and created a state-owned oil company. And in the past few decades, we've seen neoliberal economic policies imposed on Mexico and partial privatization of the oil industry. Well, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, AMLO has reversed many of those privatization policies, and he also has now nationalized lithium, which is very important because lithium is, has been referred to as white gold, and it's become one of the most important um, resources around the world today. We saw that, for instance, the 2019 coup against Bolivia's elected socialist president, Evo Morales, was partially motivated by the massive lithium reserves in Bolivia, and it's called white gold because it's become a scarce resource that is incredibly important. We need lithium for all of the all bad all batteries, any technology that uses renewable uh, rechargeable batteries. So renewable energy is very uh, heavily dependent on lithium, solar panels, and of course this camera that I'm using right now, my computer, my phone, everything in major technology today relies on lithium and a lot of it. And the fact that Mexico has nationalized its lithium is creating a state-owned company to manage lithium extraction and exports is, is very important. And joining me today to talk about this is Renata Torrent. She is one of my favorite commentators and activists and journalists in Mexico. She's also an activist with the left-wing Morena party and was a candidate for local Congress in Mexico. And she's also a professor at one of the most renowned prestigious universities, the Autonomous University of Mexico. So thank you so much for joining me today, Renata. Can you reflect on the past few weeks and this historic development of the Lopez Obrador government nationalizing lithium? You, you were involved in, in the communication and activism around this campaign. Why do you think this is important for the people of Mexico. Well, first of all, thank you for the for um, letting me speak about this, and thank you for the invitation. It's such an honor to be with you um, and talking about this uh, important development in Mexico. Because, I, as you mentioned already, there's very little information, and the information that we can find, um, or at least what I read, is very um, <laughs> corporate. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but we'll talk about it, uh, the coverage of international media on lithium and whatever is happening here in Mexico. So I'm uh, really grateful for the space. Um, well, so if if you don't mind, I'm going to talk very briefly about what happened uh, before the, um, the nationalization of lithium. Uh, first of all, it's very important to say that before uh, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, we had uh, Enrique Peña Nieto as a president. He was um, the last, probably the last president in the neoliberal era here in Mexico that lasted for 40 years. 
and he passed a very controversial uh, reform on on uh, privatization of energy basically so he was moving back from what you just mentioned about the nationalization of oil um, with Cárdenas, with President Cárdenas. Um, so in 2013, he passed this um, huge reform uh, with all the opposition uh, parties. With, I, I mean, at that point, they had the majority uh, in, the, in Congress. And this uh, reform was very controversial for three things. One, because it was passed very fast and without any public discussion. Two, because it was full of bribes. Actually, the former director of Pemex, the, oil, the state oil uh, company, he's currently in prison and he's facing a bunch of uh, accusations, not only him, but uh, a huge part of, of Peña Nieto's um, uh, state, uh, se Secretary of State and ministers and himself even, uh, Peña Nieto. So, because of these two reasons, the the, the energy reform was um, very criticized by Andrés Manuel López Obrador and uh, the entire left in the country. Um, after that, moving a little bit uh, fast to 2018, where Andrés Manuel López Obrador win um, the election here in Mexico after the third time, he was uh the the election was stolen for him in 2006 um in 2012 there was huge uh illegal stuff in the elections of 2012 and then finally he wins in 2018 with a huge margin and one of his main pro uh, promises was that he was not going to increase the uh, electricity prices and the gas uh, the gasoline prices so these two things were uh, very important in his campaign um, and when he gets into office, he realizes, I mean, we all of us knew that the reform was a disaster, the Peña Nieto reform was a disaster, but he uh, realized that a lot of the, of, of the implementation of this reform had illegal schemes, completely illegal schemes. Uh, and I'm going to talk about very briefly, briefly about a few of them. Uh, but he even tried, when, when he figures this out and let me tell you a little bit of those schemes um so besides the gra the bribes that he got uh that the the legislature legislators and uh Pemex officials uh got to pass this law this reform excuse me um they also had an illegal self-supply structure that allowed the profit from selling cheap electricity to other companies uh, and why was it cheap? Uh, because international media will tell you, well, yeah, the private sector is cheaper than this uh, state-owned uh, company. Well, not because they would uh, they would pay practically anything to uh, use the CFE. The CFE is the public state, um, the state-owned electricity company. Um, they wouldn't pay anything to use the infrastructure um, to move the, the the electricity around, right? And and so and this is illegal, literally illegal, even for the reform that he did. And so they would do, do that. They would um, concede in the reform. They would do other things that were very sketchy, like for example, they wouldn't include hydroelectric energy as clean energy. And therefore, um, all the water dams that we have in Mexico, they were not, uh, they were underused. Um, there was this complicated financial scheme to uh, financially dismantle the, the CFE. Um, well, CFE is the, the acronym the, in Spanish, I'm using it. It's the Commission of Federal Electricity, but it's this uh, public or um, state owned electricity company. So all these schemes and all these um, misuse of, of, of these uh, reforms, AMLO tries to first negotiate with the companies. And this is important to say, most of these, com uh, these companies, the, at least the, the largest 10 of them, are international companies. They don't, they're not even Mexican companies, right? Um, especially from the US and from Spain. And so they try, uh, AMLO tries to negotiate with them. Uh, they say no. So they pass this law in 2021 um, with AMLO and Morena. In September 2021, they passed this law um, to protect the electric uh, system in Mexico, the electric industry in Mexico. What happened next? Then um, the big companies start to 
uh, litigate. Um, and they so they say, no, this is what AMLO is doing, this law, it's illegal. And they are, they're, they're using our, or they're breaking our contracts. And so all this legal battle gets all the way into the Supreme Court. And hold, hold with me because all these details are important to understand what's happening. Um, so after all this, AMLO, uh, after trying to negotiate with the big companies, and after all this legal uh, battle, the, the legal battle ends in Supreme Court, and then AMLO sends uh, his reform, a, a new reform uh, to Congress uh, to try to, um, to to fix all this all this mess. What the reform the reform had three very important things. I mean, it's it's huge, and uh, um, and it would we would need an entire program for that. But there are three things that are very important. One uh, is there is a proposal to regulate all these schemes uh, in the reform. Two, it gives forty five up to 45% of the electric market to the private sector and 54% uh, to the state. What does it mean? That the state of Mexico will be, will be in charge of, of the majority of the market, but not the entire market. So this is important because some of the international media said that it was complete um, control, that, that the state wanted to take complete um, control of the market, and that's false. Um, so it was a little bit more than half, so that the state could uh, move the um, electric system and the development of the country through the <laughs> electricity um, industry the way that mo most Mexicans would, uh, would need to, right? Um, it would make the part of, the, of this, uh, this reform said that the electricity is a human right for Mexicans. Um, and so, and so those those two, and then number three, it was the national na nationalizing lithium, as as you mentioned already. So this is like a huge, a, a very short uh, summary of what happened all the way to the reform. Then the process of the reform was, for me, it was beautiful because it was uh, the, com compared to 2013 with Peña Nieto sends his reform. This was the the complete opposite because um, most Mexicans we figured out what was happening in this reform. We talked. There were literally tens of public forums. Uh, they call it uh, open parliament. So experts could go and um, argue against or, or in favor of the reform. Actually, more um, most of the of those um, open parliaments were uh, for people who were um, um, were happy with their reform, because opponents of these reforms started to go at the beginning, and then after uh, after that they figured out that their arguments were um, pretty much <laughs> um, nothing, uh, and then they stopped going. So the big corporation never went. So these big companies, Iberdrola and the, the huge companies that came to Mexico in with the reform of Peña Nieto, they never showed up. Um, and I believe once the Mexican Business Council, they went, uh, but they never came back. Um, also national and international media, this is what we were talking at the very beginning, they started to op politically to do open political operation. Uh, the Washington Post, The Economist, The New York Times, they started to a huge smear campaign against the reform. And against AMLO, as they have been doing for the last three years, but um, but it was it, it was very synchronized, right? And so they were not only. I think what is important to say here is that it's not they were not only um, trying to take away or or criticize the reform, but they were against uh, um, revocación de mandato, which is this uh, democracy the democratic process that we had. Uh, so that we, the people, it was the direct vote to see if AMLO could, uh, should stay uh, till the rest of the of the six years, or if she, sh or if he should uh, resign. So they 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 came after every single thing that AMLO was proposing at that time. Um, also, we saw the U.S. Uh, high level officials come to Mexico to talk to AMLO, the ambassador Ken Salazar here in Mexico, the ambassador to the U.S. Um, he was leading a political operation against the reform. Um, so it was pure intervention from uh, Spain. Uh, we, uh, they, they were, I mean, it was, it was just like openly uh, international operation, political operation and inter interventionism against Mexico. 
Um, so right before the um, discussion in, in Congress, uh, and with all these media attacks, uh, and national media, of course, too, right? Because national media here in Mexico is uh, completely, pretty much, like, I would say 90% of, of the corporate media here in Mexico, the national one, it's against um, everything that AMLO does. So, of course, they were against... Um, against their reform and so in the middle of all this craziness um the supreme court takes the the, the case that i was talking about about this uh, law that amlo and morena passed in 2021 to protect the the industry um and they declare this um this law constitutional so they, this was a big win for amlo because at least part of the partially at least the the, the industry of of energy in mexico was already protected regard regardless if the if the reform would pass or not um so then the discussion uh, in the Congress turns to be the most watched discussion in the Congress channel. The Congress channel is like C-SPAN um, ever, ever. No? Thousands of people were watching. We were um, on this Sunday watching the TV, watching the discussion of, uh, the, of the reform and the um, opposition. So it's formed by all these uh, smaller parties, they voted all of them against the reform and Morena and its allies, uh, they don't have two thirds of the Congress, uh, which is what, what it's needed to pass a um, constitutional reform. So it didn't pass. Uh, we needed uh, 56 votes from the opposition, uh, from the opposition and we didn't get it. And the opposition was very clear to say that they were not gonna vote anything, any constitutional um, reform that the president sends from now on. Um, so this this is just a um, it, it's important because there's uh, two other reforms that are coming. Well, one of them actually came today, but there's another one too. And so the opposition's um, strategy against AMLO is that nothing is going to pass anymore. So there's a huge public response after this, and uh, people in the streets, people on social media, start to call uh, national traders to everybody who voted on. Um, against this reform. And um, I think it's important to say that we have elections of six governors in a few months, in a few weeks on the 5th of, of June. Um, and so I, and this is my my personal belief, uh, I do believe that uh, this uh, discussion and, and the way that the, opposi the opposition voted against this reform uh, will have electoral um, consequences for them, and you can see it in the in the polls. Morena is polling pretty good in the six um, in the six states in five of the six states that, that um, are competing for governor. Um, and so, what happened at the very end with lithium, which is the, the topic that we're trying to um, explain today? Well, um, AMLO tries because of the Supreme Court had um, said that the, the law that, that Morena passed in, two, in 2021 was constitutional, then he protected the other part of the reform that was not protected in that in that first law, which is lithium. And so he sends an, uh, a reform to the mining law. So if you want to, in Mexico, if you want to reform a law, you only need half of the Congress, so 50% uh, plus one. And Morena and its allies, they do have 50% uh, and and, and, and more than 50% of the Congress. And so the day that the next day, so this was a Sunday, the, the reform was uh, was voted on a Sunday. And then on Monday, the same, the same month, the next Monday, um, we, we reformed the uh, uh, mining law and which protected lithium and didn't allow any concessions to be given to any private um, company. There's something very important to say about this. The, the Mexican constitution says that uh, all the minerals are property of Mexican state, but there's this mining law that uh, was made um, a few decades, um, it was reformed a few decades ago with Salinas. And uh, what happens here is that they, uh, they do allow concessions that are given for 50 years and that you can um, extend up to 100, 100 years. So companies from uh, Canada, especially from Canada, uh, the US, um, some from Great Britain, they, they have been uh, taking away Mexican um, minerals for, for a long time. And I'll give you a couple of numbers. Um, 
in the neoliberal era, which is the last uh, 36 years of Mexican history, right before AMLO won, um, the, if, you, if you count how much uh, silver uh, this, all these companies took away from Mexico, it's double. It's two times what uh, the, Spaniard, the Spaniards took away during 300 years of wow. domination. Two times. And if you, if you see gold, it's seven times. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, it's crazy. In 300 years. So it's more than what they got in 300 years. So the opposition said that... Um, it didn't need the. We didn't. They didn't even vote. They um. They, they just like came and then uh, abstination. I, I think that's a legal word. Um. But um. So they they most of them didn't even uh, vote for to protect the lithium and because they said that well the constitution protects the the um, all the minerals for Mexico, which is it's true it is in the constitution but there's also this law that allows uh com um, concessions to be given to uh to companies uh, national or international companies and so that was exactly what was going to happen with lithium and actually there's some contracts that were given uh in in peña nieto's uh, administration to explore and uh, extract lithium already to a few companies and so this this is just to say that it's completely false that with the constitutional uh, protection that has um, lithium was already protected. So that's a. Uh, I hope I I did an okay job to explain a little bit of what, what's happening and the way that we protected um, lithium from huge national, huge international interests. You did. You explained it very well. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent explanation, Renata. And uh, there, you mentioned something that I want to highlight because this is not discussed a lot. This is the corrupt scheme that was involved in the partial privatization under Enrique Peña Nieto, who was the former president of the pre-party. And we can talk about the pre-party in a second and also the PAN party. These are the two main right-wing opposition parties. The, the PAN being you know, a conservative party, the PRI being a party that had once been associated with the revolution but has become very neoliberal and corrupt. And, and I want to talk about really quickly a report that was published two years ago now, this actually got mainstream attention and, and it was kind of forgotten after. But I remember when I saw this report, it was back in uh, 2020, and it was it was a comments made by Emilio Lozoya, who was a former head of the state-owned oil company Pemex, and he was a close ally of Peña Nieto. And he admitted, and again, it's the report, there are many reports in Spanish media, report in the so this is mainstream business. And he admitted that there was a corruption scheme that was also involved in Brazilian corporate photograph, which became this, this big scandal across Latin America. I just want to highlight some of these, these lines from this article, and then, and then I'll pivot back to you, Renata. But just for people who, so they can understand the context here, that Lozoya, who he worked as an international relations coordinator of Peña Nieto's presidential campaign in 2012. And you mentioned that that presidential election in 2012 was very uh, scandalous. There was a lot of allegations of fraud and vote buying. And, and he admitted, again, this is an ally of Peña Nieto. He admitted that bribes were paid by this Brazilian company, Odebrecht, to Mexican officials. And they were aimed not only at winning more lucrative public contracts for the construction giant, but also at influencing Mexico's planned sweeping energy reform. So basically what they're saying here is that politicians were literally bribed to, to privatize Mexico's oil industry. And they note that, that Lozoya's job in the campaign was to obtain funding from foreign companies that could be used to pay foreign and Mexican consultants to help position Peninito's image internationally. So, and yet we're making money from foreign corporations in order to win this presidential election and then importantly push for privatization. And here's the most important rule of this article. And this is what Osoya wrote that says an ally in the who is the former head of Mexico State Payx. He admitted that it's part of the reforms that large quantities of money would have to be paid to the opposition 
so that they would vote in favor of certain structural reforms of interest to President Enrique Peña Nieto. And the cash was distributed in transparent plastic bags so the politicians could see the bills. And there was a video leaked showing this. I mean, we're talking about the most cartoonish levels of corruption where literally private corporations, including foreign corporations, are giving money to the right wing or neoliberal presidential candidate. And then he wins the fraudulent election. And there's video of them giving garbage bags, transparent bags full of money to politicians to vote in favor of privatizing oil, which belongs to the Mexican people. I mean, I, I know I, I already explained the details there, but I'm wondering if you can just comment on this and how that how that revelation was received by the people of Mexico. It's like the Simpsons, huh? Like you can't, <laughs> you can't, you can't even make this up. It's just, it's just like pure, pure material for Hollywood, if you would like to to make fun of of something like that. Um, and and just for for people who might uh, feel a, a little bit like, well, I'm not sure if we should believe everything that this lady is saying. Uh, you can just figure it out who Los Oya is. Uh, right now, what you read is um, it's part of the huge of all this huge scandal. But he's the one who's in prison right now. He's facing. I mean, he's he's in prison while he's waiting for his trial. But he has um, he has mentioned a, a bunch of, of of high level officials from last administration who were bribed, including the Secretary of um, of State. Uh, I mean, it's just, it was just obscene the way that they they literally gave away um, Mexicans' natural resources to huge companies. That's one. And then two and other- then we, I'm yeah. sorry to cut you off very quickly, yeah. Renata. Um, and, and we can also, I mean, I think we can reliably believe what he's saying because he was their political ally. And of course, the reason that he's, spilling all of this, uh, you know, letting out all this dirty laundry is because he was trying to to lower the time that he has to spend in prison. So he had a vested interest in saying, you know, truthful information about his former political allies. And also it's a it's a sign that these neoliberals, they don't they actually don't have any loyalty and they're, they're more than willing to to, to be fakes. <laughs> Totally, and actually, um, he was he was gonna at the very beginning. Losoya was gonna be a protected um, witness. Um, he was actually not in jail at the very beginning because he was working with the um, uh, with the prosecution um, to, as you mentioned, to get either little time or even no time if he, if he would give away um, some names and information. And then there's there's just a few scandals that he um, he he just went to one of the most expensive restaurants in Mexico City to have dinner, and so it was a public um, scandal. Like we we were very, I mean, it's offensive. Like you just uh, you're just like walking around and you have not given any um, big politician already. I mean, you have given information, but uh, nobody is still. Uh, we still don't have anybody else in jail. And so at the very end, because his information uh, was not leading uh, to any arrests, he was arrested. And so this, this um, plan, um, uh, well, all the, the protective um, witness, that's the way that you call it, I think so, right? There's this fear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was canceled by the, pro uh, by the prosecution because he was not uh, following the rules. So now that's why he's, um, he's in jail while he's waiting for his, um, for his trial. So that's one. And then two, other bridge, as you already mentioned. I mean, um, people have been in jail in the entire continent in Latin America for, for scandals in other bridge. Mexico was the only country where nobody, literally nobody went to uh, jail until now with Los Oya. Uh, because of the scandal with other rich, right? Like they, they, everybody knows other rich because they gave money away to pass this type of laws. Not only, not only in Mexico, but in, in the rest of of Latin America. Um, so just so that, because sometimes when you uh, say all these things, it, it, it might sound like crazy. Like you, you can't make this up, as as we mentioned. And so. Uh, I just wanted to give these two examples uh, so that people feel confident and they can actually Google um, uh, this couple of, like, of either Los Oya or, or the scandals with Odebrecht. Also, what you mentioned is very important about how um, all these uh, 
uh, treason with uh, neoliberals. It's very interesting. I, AMLO actually has uh, his last book. He wrote a book in the middle of, of his um, six years period. So we when we were three years, um, like in two, at the end of two, 2021. And he tells this story. This story it's, it's actually a very good book. Um, uh, so he tells this story about when he's a president-elect and he's talking to um, former president Peña Nieto. And Peña Nieto is um, kind of complaining about all the, the economic sector of Mexico because they they were, they, they were just, um, at the very beginning, they were happy with him because he was doing everything that they wanted. But then um, as his power was uh, decreasing because his his um his administration was such a disaster um they they just stopped uh supporting him right and so they 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 took away all the support as soon as he started um losing power so there's not such thing as loyalty in uh with these neoliberal um um uh, politicians and so that's just a, a very small story from uh this book that if you're interested it's in spanish though but it's very good yeah, I mean that that history is really important, and it's not even really, you know, it, it's very recent history. It's not like it's some distant, long past. Uh, and I want to compare and uh, Peña Nieto really quickly to López Obrador, porque, because um, we saw a lot of media reporting when Peña Nieto was president in the United States that portrayed him as the savior of Mexico. Uh, the U.S. government praised him because they said that he's implementing much needed reforms and. There was a leaked uh, um, uh, email from Hillary Clinton's email when WikiLeaks published her emails, and it showed her uh, talking with Peña Nieto and praising him for the energy reforms, the partial privatizations. And I just want to show here that when he was actually president, this is this is back a uh, tweet I from 2016. So this poll, this poll is six years old now. It shows that under Peña Nieto, I mean, his approval rating dropped from 52% at its peak right at the beginning to 23%. And then even from there, it continued to drop. So 23% approval, which was the lowest rating since 1995. I want to compare that to AMLO's, uh, López Obrador's rate, uh, approval rating. This is a mainstream intelligence firm called Morning Consult, and they do uh, studies around the world. So th this is not a Mexican firm. This is not bought off by Morena or something. This is a mainstream international firm. They show that today, this was recently published, that López Obrador is one of the most popular leaders in the entire world, at least among large countries. And so they had Joe Biden at 40%. That, that number has actually continued to decline. His approval is now around one third, around 33%. And we see that among all of these Western leaders from the United States, from France, that AMLO is nearly twice as popular as Emmanuel Macron in, in France. Andrés Manuel Obrador has 67% approval rating, and that number has been consistent. It's been even higher at some points during his administration. And, you know, you mentioned the attacks by the media. This was an infamous image that went viral in Mexico. This is the cover of The Economist magazine, which you know, is the voice of billionaire oligarchs. They they strongly supported Peña Nieto and they strongly oppose López Obrador. And here's their, their condescending image of him referring to him, uh, AMLO as Mexico's false messiah. And here you can see below him, they have Pemex and the military. So, I mean, can you just talk about the media propaganda? You mentioned that the majority of the media in Mexico most of these media outlets belong to the right-wing oligarchy and they are extremely opposed to Lopez Obrador and they also were extremely supportive of Peña Nieto even though, as I just showed, that is actually complete the, the opposite of the Mexican people. The majority of the Mexican people support AMLO and oppose Peña Nieto and yet the majority of the media opposes AMLO and supports Peña, supported Peña Nieto. Totally. Um, and, and just uh, another fact with um, AMLO's approval, there's only one uh, of big countries at least, uh, only one um, president that is more popular and it's just what for one point and it's uh, the president of India. Uh, other than that, AMLO has been consistently, even with the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, he has been 
with this number around 55 to 70 percent approval rate through through his entire um uh, presidency so this is uh, very important because if you read the newspaper in mexico or the international media uh coverage of mexico you will read just another country like you wouldn't you <laughs> wouldn't understand like oh like they they would portray him as this um the next Hugo Chavez. that's the narrative of course, the next Hugo Chavez in the international media, uh, and the national media would say this like, like that he's by himself, that nobody, um, that he's crazy, that he's stupid, that he's this very classist um, um, coverage of his image or whatever he he's. So what has he? Uh, that it, it, it's just crazy if you if you listen to Mexican uh, radio stations, it's just uh, really like a parallel world. Of what actually the numbers uh, say, not only in the polls, but also we had a um, midterm elections last year, and Morena um, continued to have more than half of the Congress. Um, as I mentioned, we have more, uh, six uh, um, six uh, six uh, states are gonna uh, renew it, its um, governors in June, and all of these states. This is important to say, are governed by PRI or PAN. And Morena is um, leading the, the um, polls in five of these six states. So the, probably they're going to get five of these six, which none of them are, are uh, from governed by Morena right now. So not only the polls, but the, the um, democratic processes that we have been leaving, the revocación de mandato, uh, this is uh, literally just to ask people, do you still want AMLO to continue or to leave at, uh, in the middle of his, of his presidency? And he won with 97% of the votes. I mean, the opposition made this um, abstination campaign, uh, but still, like he moved 16, 16 million votes in this middle of the. It, it, it wasn't at the same time of any other election, so it was just a, a process in the middle of of nothing. I mean, it was on on April 10, which we didn't have another. We were not electing anything else. So that's his base. Like he can move 16 million people, 16 million votes in the middle of Semana Santa, which is this national holiday, um, with the in national institution of the, the INE, which is uh, this national institution of elections, who has been operating against um, Morena and AMLO. Not, not, I mean, yeah, uh, not, not, not in a. They can't just uh, continue to. Um, make fraud in the elections because of the huge margin of, of win that Morena has had. But uh, if you study 2006 and 2012 election um, uh, with the INE in the middle, with it, this INE institution is the one who organizes and um, revises all the results of, of any elections in Mexico. Um, I mean, it's, it's just crazy the amount of support that, uh, that AMLO has. Uh, but as I mentioned, if you if you see the national coverage, and even I'm I'm in, in media in national media all the time here in Mexico, and if you go to debates to the corporate media, there's always like three uh, op op opposition uh, analysts against me or against another somebody else, right? So what they portray is the exactly the other way around, like three to one. Where if you would like, if you're a media platform and you want to show the reality of the of Mexico, then you have to go the other way around because most people um, approve uh, AMLO's uh, administration. So what has AMLO done? Um, this is very, I think this is um, one of the most important um, responses in terms of political, uh, the, the, I think it's just a brilliant response from uh, from any government. Um, that we can study, and I think in future years we're gonna turn around and, and understand that how AMLO um, tried to, I don't know what word to use, but to um, do a ca counter narrative. Is that the way that you think? Yeah, yeah? absolutely. Um, of what the international and national media does, and what he does is that he uh, has a conference every single morning from Monday through Friday. It lasts around two hours, and it's just a huge piece of political communication. Um, I personally listen to it every single morning uh, because he 
literally generates the agenda, the political agenda of the entire country. Um, and, and that's the way that he has uh, put some limits or, or at least some, um, yeah, because he, he doesn't want to regulate the media. He doesn't want to touch the media at all. Um, uh, so that's the only way that he, he has done politics to decrease the media power. And I think it's brilliant, it's democratic, um, and it has it has clearly has worked because if you live in a country where 90 or 95% of the media coverage it's against the president, but you still uh, can handle to maintain your, your popularity, it means that one, you're doing a good job because people are not stupid. And so they're, they're uh, seeing the results. And two, uh, there's a huge communication or a great communication strategy with the Mañaneras, which is uh, this uh, long conference that he has, that he holds every day. Yeah, the Mañaneras are incredible. I mean, it's, it's also just from the perspective of, of a leader who is relatively elderly and the fact that every morning he gives these long press conference press conferences. I couldn't do that. I couldn't give a press conference every morning for two hours like the Mañaneras. But, um, you know, you mentioned that AMLO is the first president after the neoliberal era. And I remember watching AMLO's inauguration speech in 2018, and he, he, he used this language. He said that this was the end of the larga noche neoliberal, the end of the long neoliberal night. And I think that was very interesting because he represents, I think, the Mexican equivalent of this kind of wave of progressive leaders we've seen across the world who have been trying to openly condemn neoliberalism and try to bring back a kind of left-wing politics. You know, uh, Lopez Obrador, he's not as, he's not a socialist, he's not as left-wing as some other leaders we've seen, but he definitely, he has this very progressive program. He actually, I just saw in, in a speech he gave on Twitter, he quoted Karl Marx, well, actually, he quoted Engels. Engels, who at Karl Marx's funeral referred to Marx, uh, saying that, you know, just as Charles Darwin discovered the organic biological evolution of life, it was Marx who discovered the historical, like, economic development of history. And uh, and then he also said that, you know, he supports uh, these two. He said, uh, Amlo said that these two men, referring to Marx and um, Darwin, were brilliant scientists. And he also said that, that Jesus, he also admires Jesus Christ for caring for the poor. So we see this very progressive socialistic rhetoric also bringing in liberation theology. I mean, it's very interesting to see that in Mexico because for, for my entire lifetime and for your entire lifetime, I mean, uh, Mexico and also certainly the U.S. has only had neoliberal presidents and the U.S. still only has neoliberal presidents. So Mexico helped to break this, this pattern. I, I'm, I, we can move a little bit away from, you know, the nationalization now. And I, maybe can you just talk about what the movement has been like since um, AMLO came to power and Moreno won the election? What, what is the, the 4T, the Cuarta Transformación, the, the fourth transformation? And you as, as an activist in Morena, what, what has the experience been like being part of this process after the end of the long neoliberal night in Mexico? Oh, what a great, great question. I would just like to um, mention a couple of, of, um, of data points uh, about the referendum that I think um, are very important. Um, well, and also that um, AMLO just quoted Simone de Beauvoir as well, right? Like, so, and so, so he, he has been very smart on not uh, portraying himself as, uh, as Chavez because that's a narrative that the national media has uh, tried to yeah. impose on him. Uh, but he's very smart with symbols and with quotes. And um, I think very few people know uh, so much history as he does, not only um, um, world history, but especially Mexican history. And so he's just um, a genius on on giving you some um, some um, yeah, some heat on on socialist and and the all the the theory that formed him. Um, but but well, back to just a few data. Well, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to cut you off really quickly. Um, uh, my favorite example of this is when in a meeting, which is pretty incredible, in a meeting, a digital meeting with Kamala Harris, the U.S. Vice President, 
we saw that AMLO actually quoted uh, this famous, he cited this famous quote from Porfirio Diaz, who said, um, how sad it is that Mexico is so far from God and so close to the United States. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he because he has so much um, support from the people, uh, he can get away with some of these things. <laughs> I think nobody else would. I think even uh, if you don't like AMLO, it's just a, it's just a phenomenon that we're not going to see. Like he's a political. I don't know if the, this, this translates well, but the political animal, that's the way that we say it in Spanish, a political animal. Like, we're not going to see somebody like him, at least I don't think so, in our country um, in the next 100 years. Like This is one of those leaders that uh, passed to history forever. Um, well, well, you're lucky in Mexico because your <laughs> your animal politico is AMLO, whereas in the U.S., our political animal is Donald Trump. And he... What? Uh, He's animalistic in many ways. <laughs> totally, totally. And that's another very good conversation. The relationship that, uh, how AMLO handled um, Donald Trump. It was, yeah. very, it was very interesting. And I think it was um, easier with Trump that, that what it's, um, what Biden is doing, especially with the, this reform. Um, Biden was very, and, and he's very careful on not uh, talking bad things about uh, Biden, but he's very smart too. He would never talk anything good about Biden without mentioning that Trump never ever tried to say um, a thing about national things in Mexico, right? Like, so the, the only thing, the only good, good thing that, and I'm not defending Trump, Trump is horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the only good thing about Trump is that he didn't, um, he didn't want to put his hand on electric uh, reforms on every single thing that uh, internally Mexico is doing. Well, so let me my, my feeling about that is that it's just because uh, Trump so prioritized demonizing immigration and he really wanted to prevent destabilization of Mexico because then you know, if it would if it increases immigration, then then it would really hurt his political image. Whereas, I mean, for me, it just says so much about how awful U.S. mainstream politics is where, I mean, Donald Trump, this horrible far right racist was actually less damaging, still damaging, but less damaging to Mexico than the Democratic president. Right. Because at least you knew where he's standing. Like, and, and again, I'm, I I. I used to live in the U.S. and I came back because of 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 uh, it was a craziness. Like they had uh, the immigration system was just crazy, and I had my visa and they revoked it, revoked it for anything. Like I have a personal. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't like Trump. He's he he's awful and he's racist and sexist and everything that you can say. Um, but politically for AMLO, I think it was easier to um, to work with him than with Biden, who's like this, um, yeah, we're friends with everybody. Like, and AMLO, say, oh, he doesn't say it anymore, right? But uh, the US doesn't have any friends, they, right? They just have interests. Interests. Um, so uh, just a few uh, data points about the, the referendum of AMLO. The, these 16 million, uh, these 16 million, as you mentioned, um, one, um, Peña Nieto and Calderón, the, the previous two presidents uh, before AMLO, and even I think Fox, uh, but absolutely Peña Nieto and Calderón, they didn't get as many votes. They didn't get uh, the 16 votes. They get 15 and something, um, something close, close to the 16 uh, million votes, but they didn't get. Because the um, Mexico, as you mentioned, is 127 uh, million people, but a bunch of them are kids and the participation rate in in elections is around fifty percent, and so even though the um, uh, the the voting population is ninety million, only like forty five million uh, go to vote. Um, the other half they never, absolutely never go to vote. And so AMLO won the election in two, in two thousand and eighteen with thirty million votes. So the narrative that the media wa uh, was trying to impose after the the referendum that was that AMLO lost. 14, vote, 14 million votes. This is complete madness because you can't compare a presidential election participation rate with a referendum ever. Uh, what you can compare with uh, this referendum is with other referendums. And we had another referendum last year. Um, they asked people if we wanted to um, um, if, if we wanted to pursue some legal 
uh, consequences for um, presidents, uh, for former presidents, and uh, only seven or eight million, I think seven, seven million voted uh, in that referendum. And the other example that we have is in Mexico City, because Mexico City has a um, long, the, uh, the longest history with, um, with, I can't, I don't, I can't remember how you translate this, but um, direct democracy, maybe the like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, like right. Uh -huh. um, and the participation rate is about eight percent of of, of, the, of the entire voting population. So these sixteen votes, um, the way that I see it, is not is not the 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 the, the, the largest number or the total number that AMLO could move in, a, in a, an election, but it's the floor, like that's his base. And um, and the election, as I mentioned, it was the Sunday right before Semana Santa, this huge uh, week long uh, weekend that we have. Uh, it was with no uh, information in the media with the this National Institution of Elections. They do very few um, forums or information and propaganda about what was happening in Mexico. So this was a huge win for him. And it was not only in the middle of the way, in the middle of his presidency, but it was after a little bit less than um, than a year. It was like 10 months after the midterm elections. And so that's a, that's a huge number for, for something in the middle of, of the way and with no, no support of institutional um, agencies. Uh, so just, I think that's important um, to mention. And um, a little bit of my experience and what I see in the movement, I think that uh, Morena has done um, many mistakes, I believe. Like, I, I think um, they have not done as good of a job in Congress as, as AMLO has done. Um, I think sometimes they just um, try to repeat or do exactly the same thing that AMLO is doing and I believe that um, they should move a little bit more to the left like that's the that's the margin that they they should have and they they, they could have especially because as we have been uh, um, analyzing the media has something with AMLO and portraying AMLO as this dictatorship and and these um, uh, Hugo Chavez and Maduro and, ex and everything, everything that he he does is just um, these crazy ideas that they portrayed. But I do think that the party would have some margin to move things to the left in other things like women and stuff. Um, that is also something that is not in AMLO's top agenda, right? And so I think that the party should co compensate or help in those areas that AMLO is not um, is not covering because he can't, right? He's uh, he received a country that was literally falling apart. Well, not literally, but almost falling apart. And so, um, I do think that the party uh, should do more. And I say this with uh, love because I um, uh, that's a party that I support and I, I was candid with, with this party. Uh, but I do think that there's a, a lot of work uh, to be done. Uh, but the good thing that I would love to to say and explain is uh, because this is so different than in the U.S. Um, is that this party is just made by and with people like normal people. So what is a normal day in the party or doing election for Morena? Well, they when I when I was a candidate, we, the way that we do elections is not in in, in media or. Uh, TV or whatever is just literally going knock knocking every single door of the district that you're competing for and talking to uh, trying to convince people to vote and to uh, offer whatever you want uh, to offer or whatever your platform is and so it's this um, 4T the fourth transformation uh, of Mexico it does have in its DNA that it's done with and um, for the people, uh, and so it, that's a that's something beautiful that no other uh, party has. The other parties they function a lot like uh, the the parties in in the U.S. Like both of them, the Democrats and, and Republicans, it's just like this elite, and they just rely on media, uh, the media coverage, and um, some statistics and polls. But they have no sense and no clue of what's going on on the streets with people 
Um, and this is uh, something very radically different than Morena does um, as a party. Uh, and this is something that Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador uh, founded. Like that's the way that he founded this uh, um, this party. And, and so that's it, that's just uh, I believe part of the the or at least partially the way that you can explain the popularity of Morena and of course Andres Manuel. Um, and I just uh, think it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen in 2024 that we have elections in 2024. Um, Amlo can't. Uh, and has said a thousand times that he's not going to seek re-election. Um, the opposition has always said that, oh, he's going to stay in power forever like Chavez. And he has mentioned one, well, the Constitution is very clear about it. You can't. And he would need to reform the Constitution. Uh, but he's, yeah, he's he, he really believes in his core, uh, because of Mexican history, that re-election is not um, something po uh, positive for the country, so he's not going to seek re-election. And so we'll see. There's a couple of candidates um, uh, who are uh, very interested, well, pretty um, up in the, the in the polls. Actually, the opposition has nobody, and so probably um, maybe the the opposition is just uh, trying to see which of those candidates. Will will fit better to their agenda. Um, one of them is Marcelo Ebrard, the, secret, the um, secretary of uh, foreign affairs, um, and he has he he was AMLO's uh, successor after he was um, governor here in Mexico City. So he he was the next governor in in Mexico City, um, and the other one is Claudia Sheinbaum, who's the current um, um, governor here of Mexico City, and she has absolutely done an beautiful job in um, doing even way more of what AMLO has done. So if he uh, gives pensions and money to the elderly, well, Claudia Sheinbaum has given a uh, um, scholarship to every single kid in public school here in Mexico City, every single one. No, it's universal. Uh, she has done parks, she has improved um, um, uh, public transit, she has really transformed the city. She has decreased the um, homicide rate to see, uh, up to 65%. Um, and so what we're seeing in Mexico and in the 40, uh, the discussion that we're saying is, that we're seeing is, do we want to move more to the left with Claudia Sheinbaum and uh, go deeper in this transformation? Or um, do, you, do we wanna go not back, probably not back to neoliberal era, but uh, um, Marcelo Ebrard is closer uh, to economic interests and um, um, they're not, yeah, I mean, he's not, a, he's not Peña Nieto or anything. Uh, I do respect him and I think he's done a great job too as, as foreign minister, but, um, but he doesn't, um, he, he's not gonna do even more than AMLO. If so, he's gonna, restore some of his policies probably. And so that's the discussion. And that's very exciting um, that, that we can see in Mexico that our um, discussion is between two progressives and just, just one is way more progressive than the other one. Um, uh, instead of um, somebody like the discussion that fans just had uh, with <laughs> Macron or Le Pen, right? And so I think it's very exciting time to be uh, here in Mexico. Yeah, well, this is a great transition. I, I, we're already an hour and I know uh, you have to go. So I, I wanted to conclude with this question, but I wanted to ask you about um, Claudia Scheinbaum, because um, I think what's interesting is there's been this narrative um, from the left, elements of the left attacking Morena, attacking AMLO, claiming that the, the party has been uh, too soft on patriarchy. And especially, I mean, in Mexico, of course, this is a problem that goes back many decades. There is a horrible epidemic of femicide, of violence against women. And, you know, it's it's a deep rooted problem that, of course, that existed long before AMLO. But there is, he has been criticized, his government, for not doing enough to try to stop this. And we, we there has been feminist protests against the Morena government, which I always found kind of interesting because, you know, you mentioned Claudia Scheinbaum who is the head of the government of Mexico City. She's from Morena, she is a feminist, but, but somehow like she's ignored. 
and the government is portrayed as anti-feminist. But it's it's very strange that narrative to me as an outsider. Um, I'm also glad you mentioned the the fact that Marcelo Ebrard is a, is considered as a candidate. I you know as an outsider, my personal opinion is I really hope he's not president. I really hope Claudia Scheinbaum is because honestly, from my perspective, I think one of the biggest criticisms I would have of the AMLO government so far has been some of its foreign policy decisions, voting with the U.S. against other progressive governments in Latin America, sometimes at the United Nations or at the OAS. So um, I really hope Claudia Scheinbaum personally is the next president. But anyway, um, that aside, that was just my personal view. I I'm, cur I'm curious if you can just comment, at, you know, you're a feminist activist involved in in the struggle, the feminist struggle in Mexico. I'm curious if you can just comment Obviously, it's, you know, it's a complex issue. It's not it's not black and white, but what your thoughts are um, and what your response is to people who criticize the Morena government for allegedly not uh, stressing the the issue of femicide and women's rights enough. Well, I'm going to start with that one. Um, just to clarify, uh, for those people who have read that the government has not done enough for uh, to decrease femicide, well, femicide is a uh, prosecuted by the states, not by the federal government. And so there's few things that the federal government can do to stop femicide. Because as we know, um, femicide is not just this crazy thing that you're just in the middle of your house and your husband becomes crazy and he kills you. It's just a, an escalation of violence. Um, and so most of the femicides come from your own family members, your spouse, um, uh, just somebody who, who you know. Um, so that means that the national government, the federal government, uh, they don't have a lot of things to do. It's not that like the other, that the rest of the homicides, uh, that you can work with the National Guard. Um, um, this is just another huge discussion about the militarization of the country or not, um, that I find um, very interesting on how they, they have uh, built this narrative against AMLO. Um, but what I want to say is that most of the femicides are, um, I mean, the femicides are, are prosecuted by the by state government, and the femicide rates that are the highest in the con in the country are in um, in states that are not governed by Morena. Estado de México, which is governed by PRI, Nuevo León, which is governed by uh, Movimiento Ciudadano, um, Guanajuato, uh, which is governed by PAN. Um, and so this is a this is well one yeah a huge problem and I, I'm not even um, saying that the governors are are guilty of of those rates. It's just a very deep, huge, horrible problem that we were sunk in since the guerra con uh, the um, uh, drugs uh, the drug war. The, thank you. Or the war on oh, drugs. Yeah. Exactly. Even before we had the Muertas of Juarez, but it just got really bad uh, when the, the war on drugs. Um, and, and Renata, I'm sorry to cut you off, but just for people who don't know, I find, you know, as someone from the U.S., there's this very racist narrative about Mexico as if it's always been, you know, this supposedly this dysfunctional country plagued by violence. I, I, I think a lot of people outside of Mexico don't understand how new this is to Mexico that the war on drugs goes back to Calderon. It goes back to 2006, I believe, right? It goes back to the, in the U.S., the George Bush era, and George Bush was a close ally of Calderon. So the idea that this is like some problem that Mexico has had for many decades, that's actually not true. It's a relatively recent problem. Absolutely. Mexico City had a huge problem of violence, like all the, these huge uh, cities in the world, like New York or L.A., uh, before uh, the Calderon's war. But the rest of the country was pretty safe. Like you could just drive your car in the entire country and it was safe. I, my entire childhood, I would just drive with my dad uh, from here today, from north to south, and it was pretty, pretty safe. So this is something that started in 2006. Um, and this has, the, this has been the only three years that uh, the tendency, the rate of homicides have been decreasing very slowly, but at least decreasing uh, compared to Calderon and Peña Nieto. And so, um, yeah, that's a, absolutely a stereotype. And um, so uh, the femicides, um, it's, it's kind of the same narrative that they have, um, they have uh, said about Mexico, right? That it's just this macho country. And yeah, absolutely. We do have a sexist problem here in Mexico, but we also have one of the most uh, vivid 
feminist movement in the entire world. Um, and that's very exciting and that's uh, promising as well. And speaking of the of the feminist movement, I do want to say that um, the Mexican the feminist movement explodes when AMLO and Claudia Sheinbaum starts govern start governing uh, this country. Uh, it, this doesn't mean, of course, that the, the the feminist movement didn't exist before. Um, it's been here since the revolution, way way before um, the the independence. Um, we have a beautiful history on, on feminism in Mexico, but it just became so massive when AMLO came into power. And the way that I read it is that before AMLO, we had, and, and before Claudia Sheinbaum here in Mexico City, we had these uh, governments who would rip, reprimand any type of protest. And so if you would go out on the street, they would take you to, the, to jail. Um, and so then they come from the left, and they, they have been in the streets and protesting for their entire life, both of them, AMLO and Claudia Sheinbaum. And so they have this, this commitment to any social movement that they're not going to uh, use the police force. And so that makes women safe outside. And so women decide to go out um, and, and protest. And so I do think that it's, it, I'm not saying it's AMLO's uh, um, success that the, the, the feminist movement succeeded or became massive. I'm just saying that the, the um, he, he, he did, a, he and Claudia Sheinbaum, they put, um, I don't know how to explain it, but they, um, let me think for a second. The, the, um, the the streets were safe to protest and that's not a thing in mexico that was not a thing in mexico before and so that's very important with a social movement right you're you know that you're not gonna there's not gonna be repression if you go and um, protest um and then the only the other thing that i do want to say is that morena is the only party in mexico the only party that has feminists governing like claudia Sheinbaum, but there's a lot other other uh, governors, uh, Colimas, um, another, another country, uh, Baja California's um, governor, they're feminists as well, uh, Campeches. Um, so it's the only party who has feminists governing um, states that they have feminists in the Senate, in the Congress, uh, and in the party, right? The only, the only party. Um, the, of course, not PAN, not anybody else. Another thing, Morena is the only party who um, who has passed legislation to um, le legalize abortion in seven states already, and so this is something that has to be regulated by by each state. And so it's the only the only single um, um, party that has done it. Is the only party who has um, an AMLO too, his cabinet, his um, his ministers. I'm sorry. Um, but but bad English. So his ministers. No, no, no. It, we we say cabinet as well. Cabinet, it's the same. Uh, half of them are women, right? And so, and the Congress, half of the Congress is is um half half and half is, is women, women and men. And so, the, all these advances, what I want to say, cannot be explained, including uh, protests in Mexico City. This, this, all these advances in the in the feminist movement and the, in the feminist agenda cannot be explained without the context of the 14. And that's a win for everybody, for, for men, women, the, the feminist movement, and of course the 40. It's just that I believe that um, the 40 has not done a good job explaining all, all these uh, advances that they have had. They created the national system of, of caregiving. Um, there's just a lot of things that has been done in 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 the women's agenda uh, that have not been communicated very well, I believe. Uh, so that's um, some critics for for the for the movement. But I also think that the media has uh, just done anything in their power to say we are the feminists, we who have stopped abortion rights for our entire life, right? For our entire lives, we are um, the gatekeepers of feminism and so they have been portraying AMLO as a macho um, and Morena as a macho even though it's the only party as I mentioned that has a strong um, feminist activist inside the party and in um, leadership positions in the in the government and as governors yeah and uh, it is also interesting to see 
right wing opposition parties pretend to be feminists. I remember seeing a speech by AMLO. I believe it was in a mañanera when he joked that suddenly overnight his conservative opponents had become feminists. So right. it's very cynical. We, it's very cynical. We joke that it's another miracle of the 14th. They're all feminists now. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I really want to thank you. We were speaking with Renata Torrent, who is a great Mexican activist professor, journalist. You should follow her all on Twitter at rturrent. And uh, you also, for people who speak Spanish, you should definitely check out her interviews. She mentioned that often when she's featured on the media, she's often uh, debating three opposition pol <laughs> politicians at once. And and if I can say so, I think she she always wins those debates. It's, it's a pleasure having her here. She also has a show um, on uh, what is it? Is it Channel Twenty One, Capital Twenty uh, One? It's a public, uh, the public channel of Mexico City. Of the, uh, it's uh, public TV, um, and so you can watch it. It's uh, political analysis, uh, but I only, I mostly invite women, and I just try to to do the other way around of most uh, TV shows that are all men <laughs> talking about politics, and so I do the other way around. So I, mo for the most part, I invite women. Some sometimes I invite some. Uh, good friends that are guys, but uh, for the most part, we're women talking about politics. Yeah, well, for anyone who speaks Spanish, I would highly recommend checking out her interviews. And uh, Renata, um, in addition to your Twitter, do you want to plug anything and, and tell people where they can find any work that you do? Well, I try to put everything on Twitter and Instagram. My Instagram is the same, uh, uh, um, at our T U R R E N T. Um, so you can find everything that I'm doing um, uh, in media pretty much every single day. Um, I do get invited to the Reforma, which is this like very conservative party, <laughs> and having very conservative newspaper sometimes to debate. And uh, I do my best. I do apologize for my rusty English. I have not spoken any English in three years, so it's hard to come back to speak English, but I hope well, I made myself a little bit clear. <laughs> it didn't seem rusty at all. It, it oh. was very, it was very, very good. So thank you so much. And, and as I always say, I feel bad, uh, eh, lo lamento. I always feel bad asking my uh, Latino and Latina comrades to speak in English, the colonizer's tongue, but, uh, um, Don't even mention it. It's a pleasure that way I practice so anytime and I really appreciate the space again. Uh, I, I do think that there's a few interviews or people who can speak on what's really happening in Mexico. And so it's important for people to, to see that uh, what the Washington Post is saying is not always true. Exactly. And that today is why I brought you on. So thank you again, Renata Turren. And uh, for anyone watching or listening, uh, please, you can support the show at multipolarista.com slash support. And I will be back next week. So thanks a lot, Renata. Thank you, Ben. Hugs. <laughs>